The Nuts and Bolts of Writing, Season Two, a podcast where we talk about literature, the ins and outs of writing, and how to actually start writing. Hi, everyone. Today, we're talking to artist and writer Carrie Knowles about her approach to writing nonfiction. Check out our previous episode, episode two eleven, about her approach to writing fiction. Carrie Knowles is a prolific award-winning author and arts advocate. Along with her nine books, she has published short stories, newspapers, and magazine articles, and received numerous awards for her writing. She was named the North Carolina Piedmont. A laureate for short fiction in 2014. Carrie has published five novels Lillian's Garden, Ashwin's Rug, A Garden Wall in Provence, The Inevitable Past, and A Musical Affair, as well as Black Tie Optional, a collection of 17 of her short stories. Her memoir, The Last Childhood, a family story of Alzheimer's has been described as a must read for family members caring for a loved one with Alzheimer's. During her time as the 2014 Piedmont Laureate, conducting writing workshops across five counties in North Carolina, she wrote a writing workbook aimed at providing the basic tools a new writer would need to get started, a self-guided workbook and gentle tour on learning how to write stories from start to finish. She writes a personal perspectives column for Psychology Today, Shifting Forward, and has recently published a collection of the first 50 stories from her column titled Shifting Forward, 50 Reflections on Daily and Everyday Life. To learn more about Carrie, go to her website at www.cjanework.com. We have provided a link in the description. So last episode, we talked to Carrie about her approach to writing fiction. In this episode, we'll be talking about Carrie's approach to writing nonfiction. Carrie, welcome to the show again. Thank you for having me back. Yes. So the first question is, what prompted you to start writing nonfiction? Nonfiction paid the bills. It was very simple. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I actually started writing professionally while I was still in college. Um, the first writing professional writing job I had was with WXYZ Radio in Detroit. I went to school at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan, and um, I wrote for their advertising department. And at that time, WXYZ Radio had a, a financial interest in the Detroit Lions. So I did a lot of work with their promotional work for the, you know, with the Detroit Lions and also did some other um, on-air things. It's kind of when I fell in love with doing radio over the years, I've done a lot of radio work, which I absolutely adore. And I think that um, I don't do that much commercial work anymore, but if somebody came to me and said, um, we'd like you to, to write radio scripts, I would be there in a flash. I just find radio absolutely uh, just way too much fun. They're like little bitty short stories. Um, and then the last two years of college, um, uh, my boss at WXYZ Radio lost, got fired. So the whole department got fired. And that that's what used to happen back then. Head guy got fired. Everybody got fired. And so we all got la laid off, fired, whatever. And I needed a job. Um, my parents didn't have money to send me to college. And the only way I could go there was to work. And it, back in the 60s, you could do that. You could work part time and you could pay for college. That's not possible anymore. But, you know, so it sounds like a fairy tale, but it was completely possible to do it then. And I saw an ad for a um, Michigan sports magazine called Competitive Breed. And um, I wound up getting a job writing stories for them. And I would leave school every Friday afternoon with the um, with the editor of the magazine a photographer, a uh, mechanic, and myself. And I would cover speedboat, motorcycle, ATV, you know, yeah, anything that moved manageable. 
um, I would cover races and do profiles of people. And then I would come home Sunday night and I would go all over the state of Michigan with these folks. And we would go to these various races and I would meet these various people, write these various things. I'd go home Sunday night. I'd write all my copy and I'd turn it in Monday morning and go to school. And that's how I paid for my last two years of school. Wow. So I went from mm-hmm. not possible these days. So, you know, writing nonfiction allowed me, you know, allowed me to have a life as a writer and I could pay my bills as a writer. And um, so I wound up doing commercial work such as, um, you know, ads, advertising, um, annual reports, advertising, corporate things, descriptions, little videos for, you know, how to plug in something. I did a very interesting thing. What I thought it was interesting. And I'll talk about that a little bit more um, thing about switching stations, you know, which was an electronic thing. So I had to learn all about that. I, I always tell young writers that the, um, no job, you never say no to a job, to a writing job, because if you have to learn something to write the copy for it, that's that's made your writing life richer. You can put that information in a pocket and keep it and use it in a story sometime else. And, and you can also learn the language. Um, I've written a lot with medical articles um, and uh, Years into it, I was married and we had kids and one and that the local newspaper in Raleigh um, on Thursdays, that was the day where they did the food section. And one morning I was sitting there um, and the kids had gone to school and I was sitting there reading the food section. And I thought, this is going to sound really ugly. I thought, you know what? There are a lot of women that this is the only thing they have the time to read every week is this food section. And this is so poorly written. I just want to poke my eye out. And I thought I can do better than that. I'm going to give people better things to read. And so I began writing about food and I spent a number of years writing food articles for magazines and newspapers. And eventually I became a restaurant reviewer and all of these little things paid all the bills that I had. And it was, fun. And uh, I've used that information and in my fiction. So anyway, I love nonfiction. Wow. Yes. That really hit a chord with me because I've had experience doing similar things, you know, ever since I was in school, you know, I've been helping out my dad and some other people with marketing copy. And, you know, I've learned a lot of different things from writing about subjects that I would have never ordinarily read about, you know, ranging from traditional Chinese medicine to environmentalism and marketing. Isn't it great? And, you know, you can take that information and you can move it to some other thing. You could move it to fiction. And it it's just your world is bigger because of it. I think that's the great thing about writing is that your world just gets bigger. Yes, because I learned a lot about subjects that I would have not ordinarily, lear- ordinarily learned about. And, you know, I I think that's really helpful. And it also makes my mind grow bigger, too, because it really helps me to process information faster. And, you know, you know, basically, I have to write about these subjects that I don't know about, for example, programming, I only know a tiny bit of programming, I can't tell you about, you know, so and so programming language, but sometimes I have to write about that. So I force myself to read it and understand it and write it in a way so other people can understand it, too. And that has really helped me, you know, hone my communication skills and my writing skills because you know I have to digest these concepts and regurgitate them in a way that makes sense to people that's you're so right and I'm so glad to hear you say that because so many people say oh no 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 you know I don't want to do that I'm like no 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 always say yes and uh find out something new and you know be smarter you know just get smarter and what a wonderful way to do that um the other thing is I personally like research. I like, like in my fiction, if you ever, um, if I ever mention a street or a building, 
it's because that's a real street and that's a real building on that street. So I have all these maps and I have things that I've collected from places I've traveled to. And so, you know, I want it to be grounded in real things. And that's just my, how I think about the world. And that also helps me to be able to write nonfiction because I want to know, well, how does that work? Mm -hmm. You know, and um, when I traveled with the mechanics and I didn't know anything about cars and motorcycles, I'm still not sure I know anything about a motorcycle or a car, um, but I had somebody who I could say, okay, is this the right language? Is this the right word? And they would, you know, when I finished copy, I would send it to them first before I ever send it to my editor and saying, is this stupid? Did I say this right? Did I get this right? Do I understand this? And and so little by little, I would learn what the right terms were, except for we were always, you know, the language was always changing because um, motorcycles are different than speedboats. But, you know, but I had a big language that I needed to learn. And that was really exciting to me and fun. Just mm -hmm. lots of fun. Absolutely. So the second question is, what is the difference between the facts as truth versus the emotional truth? And this is a question that we previously asked in episode, you know, 211 about writing fiction. So how is it like, um, you know, how, how would you answer this question from the perspective of someone writing nonfiction? That's easier than it sounds. And it's a little bit different than my answer for fiction. So you should have listen to the podcast about fiction. So in nonfiction, the emotional truth becomes the narrative. And if you don't have a story, the narrative is the story. You have the facts. And what's the story behind the facts? What's the human story behind the facts? Or the animal story behind the facts? You know, so give me a narrative um, because, and I just read an article this afternoon uh, from a philosopher saying, that's how we learn. That's how we change as people is through stories, is through narration, is through understanding through the narrative. So, you know, um, if you tell me, oh, there's a war in Syria or, you know, this horrible thing that's going on in the Ukraine, you know, if you just say, oh, there were six bombs dropped, you know, in Ukraine last night. What does that tell me? You know, I skip over that and I go to the next page. But if you give me a narrative about where that was, who was involved, what happened because of that, how that changed the war, how this was going to happen, how that, that's the narrative, that's the emotional truth. That's how did those six bombs impact the lives of those people? That's when it gets interesting. That's when I become empathetic to that story. And I want to stay with that story and know more about it and make a decision myself as to what side I'm on with this. Um, and I think the narration helps us make more intelligent decisions, emotionally based intelligent decisions about, is this true? Do I care? Um, what's going on? What can I do? And that's mm -hmm. very important in nonfiction. Very, very true. I, I totally agree. I think in a sense, they're actually very similar because you can't just regurgitate facts. You have to think about the theme and how it's going to uh, look like for other people and what are they going to glean from it? That's very important for both fiction and nonfiction. You know, it's interesting. Um, the uh, the inevitable past, um, which uh, one of the books that you mentioned, um, in that the the main character it's you know at the turn of the century, and um, and one of the key things that happened at the turn of the century, which I found out, which I love, was that the Remington typewriter was invented, and the Remington typewriter was this big black thing with black keys, and the letters were white on it. And it, it changed how office work was done. Previous to that, men were the ones who by hand wrote out, you know, all the details and the bills and the this and the that. And it was a man's job. When the typewriter came, for some reason, the men didn't want to do that. It became a woman's job to do it. 
The people who did that job were not called, as we call them today, typists, but they were called typewriters. They were called by the same name as the machine. And it, you know, I found that a very dehumanizing thing. The same thing happened with computers. Um, you know, uh, we we dehumanized the people who worked for them initially, and you know, we gave them the same name as you know uh, those big mainframe computer things. But anyway, that that women were called typewriters. And by the way, they had to wear black skirts and white blouses. So they look just like their typewriters oh. too. <laughs> but you know, if I tell you that, then that that's image is going to stick with you about the Remington typewriters. You're going to know something more than if I said the Remington typewriters were developed at the turn of the century. So what? You know, nobody uses those anymore. <laughs> But if I give you that little narrative about those women, then that story is going to stay with you. You're going to remember it. Exactly. Totally agreed. So how do the basic tools of writing good fiction apply to nonfiction? Ah, very important. People who write bad nonfiction don't understand any of the rules of fiction. Um, and good nonfiction has a main character. Good nonfiction has a setting. Good nonfiction has a story arc. So it takes you somewhere and teaches you something and you get a chance to learn and then change your idea at the end of it. I had a very interesting thing happen. A couple, you know, I, I don't do it very often, but uh, sometimes if um, I've had maybe a dozen or more uh, PhD candidates come to me via other people and ask for my help. And I only do it if the head of their committee knows I'm working with them. And I don't rewrite stuff. I just coach people through writing it. And I had a situation like that uh, several years ago. And um, it, it was someone I knew and their um, dissertation was about fresh water in the mountains of North Carolina. And he had been struggling for a year and a half trying to write his dissertation. And he just couldn't make it work. And he, he, he didn't know where he was going with it and he couldn't make it work. And his committee was like, gotta go back. You gotta, you know, you got, you, you're missing the point. You're not, he couldn't figure out what was going wrong with it. So we talked for about an hour I had him tell me what he was working on, what his research was about and everything. And when he finished, I said, okay, who's the main character? And he said, well, there's no main character because this is, this is science. And I said, okay, who's the main character? He said, well, it's science. There's no main character. And I says, yes, there is. Tell me, once you know who, I said, once you can discover who your main character is, you will be able to write your dissertation. And he looked at me and he said, the main character is fresh water, isn't it? And I said, yes. So a main character is a main character because they impact everything around them and everything around them impacts them. That is what a main character is. And the minute he understood that, he was able to write his dissertation. He called me up two months later and said, it's done. Wow, I did it. It's awesome. Because he understood. And, and we make a mistake to think that nonfiction just is a series of facts, you know, that are just spewed forth and goes from A to B. No, it's a series of facts about a main character. Find your main character and you will find the key to writing good nonfiction. Well said. So question number four. Why might you want to move nonfiction to fiction with an emphasis on the power of narrative to build a story? There's a lot of reasons to move nonfiction to fiction. Um, and part of it is to um, not get sued, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, always a good reason, by the way. Um, part of it is, in all seriousness, to... Um, be able to tell the truth. And, and I say that in, and let's say that you're, you are writing 
a nonfiction story um, about um, something that happened in your lifetime or it, within your family, something that you know intimately about. You're going to have always Jiminy Cricket sitting on your shoulder saying, mm, you know, if you said that, that would be so not nice. Don't don't say that. And so it becomes very hard for you to tell the real emotional truth of what happened with something. When you get stuck with this story being too hard to tell because you're always censoring, you don't want, you know, your mother said, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. In anything at all so then you get stuck not saying anything that's not nice and so actually you don't say anything at all you don't really move the story forward so at that point I say to people take it out of nonfiction. let's move it to fiction you tell me how it felt for you you tell me what really happened the other reason these days is to take things into fiction versus nonfiction is um Let's get rid of the, you know, the politics of it. Let's get rid of the scary parts of it that are, you know, people are going to, you know, tune out. Let's get rid of saying, pointing fingers and saying, he said, she said, let's move that to a fictional situation and let the reader discover for themselves who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. Don't tell me who the good guys are. Don't tell me who the bad guys are. Let me discover that myself. And so that's easier to do in fiction than it is to do in nonfiction. Because in fiction, you can make the bad guys really bad and you can make the good guys sort of good, good enough. And you can show me instead of telling me. Sometimes in nonfiction, people feel obligated to tell the story. But in fiction, you show me the story. And when you show me something, you give me an opportunity to think for myself. And so then I think fiction becomes much more powerful. When you allow your reader to think for themselves, then you've caught their attention. And that's important. Very, very true. You know, I, I think a lot of people just don't have the proper understanding of what nonfiction is. Like you said, it's not just a documentary. It's not just a collection of facts or, you know, um, an encyclopedia article or anything. You know, it, there is a way to do it. And there, narrative is part of telling a nonfiction book. I mean, writing a nonfiction book. I've been reading, which I absolutely, I'm so excited about. I'll grab the, it's on my desk, which I don't want you to see how messy my desk is. Um, there's a wonderful historian. Her name is Doris Kearns Godwin. And I'm reading her very large um, nonfiction work. Uh, it actually won the Pulitzer Prize a couple of years ago called No Ordinary Time, which is the story of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt um, during World War II. And it is such a brilliant piece of nonfiction that's filled with narrative and with storytelling and wow it's like um the same book told without that narrative i wouldn't remember any of it mm -hmm. but the stories she's able to come up with and and give you those narratives are so rich and interesting that i'm not even sad that's a 500 page book you know mm -hmm. exactly right so question number five do you have any general writing tips for all writers, whether they are writing fiction, nonfiction, autobiographies, or marketing copy? Yes, I think the most important thing is, particularly these days, it's to tell the truth and do your research. Uh, know what you're talking about. Don't just make it up. Um, even if it's fiction, uh, find the, uh, the elements of truth within the fiction so that that anchors the work. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, that's the best advice I could give is to be truthful in, in the work that you're doing. And if you're doing advertising copy, boy, really, you know, understand what you are doing with that, what the truth is with that. And um, once you find that, you can, it's easy to write. Mm -hmm, definitely. 
Yeah, like you said with the the guy with the PhD, you know, once you find out the main character, you know, it's pretty easy. Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, it's it's not so easy, but it it, it is easy, easy enough. <laughs> I, I had a, a wonderful opportunity many years ago to meet Isaac Asimov and um to spend an evening with some other writers with him. And uh it was it was thrilling and uh just kind of the highlight of a literary career to be able to spend time with somebody like Isaac Asimov. And one of the things he said that night was, if anybody tells you that they write more than four hours a day, they're lying. He said, nobody can do it for more than four hours a day. It's too exhausting. But that four hours, what he meant by that was where you're actually producing words for four hours. There's lots of time where you can go do research and think, give yourself time to think. I think the worst thing that computers have done is it is they've taken away the time that writers used to get to think about what they were writing. When I first started writing advertising copy or writing for magazines or writing for newspapers, editors would call me. This was before computers. Editors would call me and say, hey, we would like you to do a story about this or that. And we want uh, 1,500 words, and we'd like you to cover these things. And I'd say, great, sounds terrific, wonderful. Hang up the phone. I'd start my research. And two days later, two days later, imagine that, I would write my copy, and I would put it in an envelope. I would type it up, put it in an envelope, take it to the mailbox, send it to that editor, they would get it maybe two days later and they would call me. Now that meant that I, now five days have, have passed. So I've had five days to think about what I have written. I had five days to think about what else I might want to write with that. And an editor would call me and say, hey, we really like this piece, but we would like uh, a sidebar, uh, a 250 word sidebar about this. And I'd say, that sounds great. I hang up the phone, bam, I do the research. I'd write the 250 word side word. Once again, I'd put it in an envelope, put it in the mail, off it would go. So now I get a call or I get an email. We want 1500 words uh, by four o'clock. Oh, we didn't like that part. Could you, get, oh, it's four o'clock. Oh, mm -hmm. so now could you give us another hundred words about this? Mm, okay. We'll need it by tomorrow morning. There's no time. We've lost that time to think. And so give yourself time to think when you're working on your novel, when you're working on your article, when you're working on your pitch. Don't just shoot from the hip. Give yourself time to think, do the research, get it right and go forward. Mm -hmm. Wonderfully put, you know, I, I agree because sometimes if you space things out, you know, you get a different perspective, but if you just do everything in one go, you know, sometimes you make not only spelling errors or typos or weird syntax problems, but then there's like logical holes or this is just not phrased properly. Well, I think that those logical holes are really so tripping, you know, um, or you've got the information wrong, or you're so much in a hurry that you're going to believe what you found on the internet to be true. Mm -hmm. exactly. and when you need to pick up the phone and call somebody else and say, tell me what you really said, mm -hmm. what really happened. Um, know your librarian, you know, find a librarian who you can call and say, help me with this, you know, mm -hmm. where should I go to find the truth about the answer to this? And like, um, you know, there there are many, many reference libraries all over the country. And, you know, there's reference librarians. Libraries have people called reference librarians. And you should make those, you should bake cakes for those people. You should be able to call those people and say, help me find this, you know. Don't trust everything you find on the internet. Find it in real life. Mm -hmm. Very true. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I think, you know, after our next episode, which is episode 213, which is about, you know, your approach to visual art, we may have an episode, you know, where you talk about research, because 
this is something that interests a lot of people, including a lot of our co-hosts. You know, you know, one of our co-hosts of the podcast, R. N. Ravelle, is a writer of historical fiction herself. So, you know, yeah. and you have written that book about, you know, Provence. So, you know, I think maybe in the future, you know, you and her or me, all three of us can talk about, you know, how to do research for historical fiction. I think that would be I think very that would interesting. Be great fun. Um, the Inevitable Past is um, based on, you know, based on history. Um, and uh, there was a lot of research with that. And there's a lot of research with the piece I'm working on now. And it's, um, it, it's good. Re it, research is a good thing to do these days. I wish more writers spent more time doing research right especially you know like you said real life research because now when people talk about research they just think about typing something into google and looking at google scholar or if they're in university you know going through jstor or something like that there's more to research than that exactly mm -hmm. right well, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast again. And, you know, we cannot wait for you to come back. You know, there's so much to talk about. <laughs> well, I've had so much fun, Imelda. And it was great to meet you and great to talk with you. And what fun to find somebody to talk about books with. I love it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye.